A man who preyed on young women and teen girls and coerced or forced them into porn has just landed on the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list. 39-year-old Michael Pratt is accused of leading a ring for seven years to recruit women and underage teen girls to engage in sex by force, fraud, and coercion. Pratt operated a production company and very well-trafficked websites out of San Diego. Those websites have since been shut down. The FBI says Pratt recruited hundreds of victims from across the U.S. and Canada through fake ads for modeling jobs. After he lured them in the door, Pratt forced or coerced them into participating in pornographic videos. Pratt also allegedly paid women working at his company to be references for the modeling ads. They would assure the victims that any videos they were in would never be posted online. Of course, that was all lies. Some women tell prosecutors that they were held against their will for hours. Once the video productions began, some women were not permitted to leave the shooting locations until the videos were completed. Pratt went on to run during a civil trial in 2019. and He's had a federal warrant for his arrest since then. He's wanted on multiple felonies, including conspiracy to commit sex trafficking by force and child pornography. His websites brought in $17 million, so he has the money to be hiding anywhere. Feds say Pratt has numerous ties abroad, and the FBI say there are hundreds of possible victims it wants to hear from. Yes, the websites have been taken down, but obviously these videos are still out there haunting the victims. $100,000 reward is being offered for information that leads to his arrest. But more broadly, stories like these don't get covered enough. This is a mass business of dangerous, unscrupulous men fooling and then coercing, sometimes forcing young women in this country into porn. This guy is one of many who do this. But by putting Pratt on their most wanted list, the FBI is fortunately trying to help change that. Joining me now is Sherry Caltagironi, founder and executive director of the Global Emancipation Network. Thank you very much for coming on the program. Really appreciate it. All right, so how do people like this guy Pratt get away with this stuff for so long? Are the girls and women ashamed or afraid to come forward? You've hit both of the difficulties on the head here, Dan. One thing that we seem to forget is that most of the time, victims of trafficking don't really identify with themselves as being victims of human trafficking. And even in those that do, it's really difficult to come forward because oftentimes the victims of trafficking are the already marginalized communities. These are uh, runaway youth, youth, foster care, indigenous peoples, LGBTQ youth, and so on. Communities who have often had negative encounters with law enforcement anyway. So then when their traffickers are also telling them stories about if you go to the police, we're going to kill your family, you're going to be deported and whatnot, they really tend to believe it. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I have concerns about the idea that somehow, you know, they're afraid of law enforcement. I think that's a somewhat of a different issue than the one that, that I'm kind of focused on, which is the fact that law enforcement is doing the right thing uh, here as opposed to uh, the, in my view, very often false perception that people have that it's law enforcement's uh, fault. But mm. coming back to coming back to, to to this issue of this guy Pratt, I mean, look, we could talk all about Pratt, right? But it's about way more than Pratt. There are a lot of guys out there, men, unscrupulous, dangerous criminals, who are doing this. They're pretending to be whatever it is, modeling agents, they're pretending to be this, and then they get these women into a, wherever it is, a hotel room, a this, a that, and then suddenly these young girls, 16, 18, 20, I don't know, whatever their ages are, are suddenly in this impossible situation that they've been put into by these guys, and their lives are about to change. And, you know, this stuff has to stop. And so how do you further criminalize this? How do we get more accountability for these men? I think that we're at a really interesting point in this in this counter trafficking space where we are starting to see more civil litigation that is resulting in judgments. For example, in this case, we already know that there has been a civil suit with over 20 victims who were already awarded $13 million. Uh, this is not the first one of those cases. There have been similar cases still with uh, youth trafficking charges involved against adult con content websites, um, play, you know, web group, MindGeek, um, you know, the erotic 
review board, the list goes on and on. You're right that there's an epidemic of this sort of material out there. Um, but unfortunately, the way that legislation is currently written, it's really unclear sometimes where the liability for that lies and whether it's civil or criminal liability. So in the United States, we have the Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act yep. um, on that. And abroad, too, we have some other pieces of legislation. But it still is really difficult, especially when uh, Internet crimes are bordering. Well, you, you got it. Sorry to cut you off. We're out of time. Please keep up the good work, Sherry. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for watching. Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your cable provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage.